Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, it's, it's not only me. My name is Blake Arandell. I am one of the partners at Protoplay, which is the innovation consultancy firm which specializes in prototyping. But we also have another partner over there, Josep Luis Sanchez, <laughs> who, looks, who looks like anything but an innovation consultant. <laughs> But he's quite a genius, and you'll see some more of that later. But before, before we begin uh, working on, on the actual prototyping, let us introduce you a story which might seem very far from prototyping. Some of you may know this story. I once had a, a development teacher tell me this story from uh, this village in a remote village in the Congo, where he said that there were these, these women that would spend, there was no water in the village, no clean water, so they would have to travel 10 kilometers one way, pick up 20 liters of water, and come back 10 kilometers. You can imagine what a hassle that is. And that's not even having enough clean water for cooking, for cleaning, etc. But it was 20 kilometers every day and carrying 10 kilograms of water. So these development experts, these experts that that knew or, or thought they knew what these people uh, wanted, they went there and they said, okay, we're gonna do a very, very simple uh, project, which is we're gonna build a well. We detected there's some water underneath, so we can actually build a well and start building water. It seems like a pretty good value proposition, right? It's, it makes sense. Uh, we get the water, they don't have to walk 10 kilometers or carry it on top. So they spent a while building the well. They built a perfect, excellent well that worked perfectly, and then they uh, had a party and inaugurated the well, and then said, everybody can pick up their water from this spot over here. And th this is a true story, by the way. I, I don't know the real name of the, of the town. A week later, that well was broken. Somebody had broken it. So what they did is they rebuilt the well, and a week after that, the well was broken again. And when they started researching or trying to find out what was happening to that well, one of the development experts, uh, one of the women, found out that who, who would you think was breaking the well? Does anybody, I don't know if anybody knows the story. It's, it was a women that were breaking the well. The same women who they were trying to save from those 20 kilometers every day, from those 10 kilograms of water on their heads, because they later found out those four hours they dedicated every day was the only time they could get away from their homes, from their husbands, from their usual problems in the town. They, it was the only time where they got to talk and walk and just chat about nothing in particular. So what would seem so clear at the beginning, at the end, really wasn't clear. It was, it was a surprise. And this is why we prototype. Because we consider that the fatal mistake is when you devote so much time to building something, to building the perfect well, to learning about what's going on, but then you launch and the people you were building it for don't want it. And that's a real problem. We think that there is learning at the beginning that can be done otherwise. And then when you have to build the, the, the well, when you have to build the thing right, is when you want to scale. But at the beginning, there's techniques to do this. Somebody who knew a lot about this prototyping is, is this man over here. Anybody know him? Donald Rumsfeld, the US Secretary of State. He told the nation in 2003 that there are things we don't know that we don't know. Of course, he said it to scare the shit out of the country. But it says a lot about product development and customer development. You see, there are things that we know that we know, things that we consciously know. These are facts. These are facts that we know, they're proven, etc. Then there are things that we don't know that we know, which are hypotheses. We have hypotheses. Whenever we embark on a project, we have assumptions that we think will work right. Then there are things that we know that we don't know, which are questions that we want to test. But then there's this little spot over here. By the way, this you can do researching. This you can do asking questions, you can find out. And this is something you have in your mind. This, these are things that you unconsciously already know. But there are things that you ignore, such as the fact, as those development experts in the village that, that ignored 
that that time for the women, those four hours every day was time devoted to their, their, their passion or their, their, it was good time for them, it wasn't a problem. And this, is, this only comes out when you're prototyping. This only comes out when your product is in the person's hands. Okay, so this is, this is basically the reason why we exist and we do what we do. And, but it's, I love the cute dog, by the way. <laughs> we can have him pitch later on. So just to uh, get working on this, we're gonna show you a few techniques of prototyping now. The idea is that we don't do all the talking or the, <laughs> we don't do all the talking or anything, but the idea is that we will have you using the techniques that we have so that you can actually get used with the methodology. We have four people pitching. Let's see if we can have more. We'll see. But this is one technique. This is known as the false door, which is, uh, is a technique that, that is used to prototype. It's a very simple technique. So for example, let's say, and I'm gonna ask you this question. Let's say you have a restaurant, uh, you have a, an, an Italian restaurant, and you want to launch a new pizza. You want to have something else on your, on, to offer your clients, which is uh, Asian pizza, uh, I don't know, Beijing style pizza. The typical mistake would be to order, um, order some ingredients, maybe have a chef look into some recipes, start cooking it, maybe let your customers try it, et cetera. Of course, in a restaurant, that is not that bad. That takes about two, three days. But if you take that into the context of a big company, that is a year and a year and a half of, of product development, a lot of money spent, et cetera. And then maybe you launch a pizza and nobody wants it. Does anybody have an idea on how you could test it straight away, like that, if your customers were like this pizza? Ask them before. Ask them before you cook. Ask them before. That's, it's, it's a good, so asking is, is good because people will, will tell you an answer. You can actually have some, but we tend to rather observe what people do rather than ask what they would do. We want to see what they would do, so. You put it on the menu. A, Exactly. So that so asking asking is good, and it, it's it's one of the techniques that's always been used. But we tend to rather go ahead and, and just put it on the menu. So what his answer was is putting it on the menu, and then having people order it, and then when and when they order, you're like, oh, we don't have it. We're we're out of it. It's, it's done. If only one person asks, then you don't have a business. If a hundred people ask, then you better start making the pizza a la Beijing. We actually use this technique, for example, many times for our clients when we have to, they, they give us a product and what we do is we create a, a fake Facebook page and we create different ads and then with different claims, launch it for one week, maybe put in four or five euros and see which one gathers more likes, more clicks, et cetera. And you're able to go with a very trustful result and say, hey, look, this is, this is, this, this raised much more interest than the other ones, okay? And as a matter of fact, and this is going to be, I'm sorry for putting this face on you right now, but uh, as a matter of fact, I can say, or uh, we can say, we can vouch for the fact that this man won the last elections. Actually, if you see, uh, the, everybody know who this guy is? Because we're speaking English, but I guess. <laughs> so he's the most least popular president this country's ever had. He's at 30% rating, 30% rating. But in the last elections, there were elections in December and then elections in uh, six months later, which was in June. He was the only polit political party that won votes. They won votes from 7.2 million to 7.7 .7 million. And what, I don't know if you know, but not many people don't know is that one of the success factors, and I believe their core success factor, was getting in touch with this group, the Messina group. What they did is uh, they got hired for 200,000, I mean, they got f like a minimal uh, project. They just brought in two people from, they're a group that helped Obama win the re-election, that helped uh, Cameron win his election. And what they did is they brought in two consultants from San Francisco, whose only job was to find out where, if they got more votes for the, for the PP, they would get 
uh, another um, escaño, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, another chair, another seat in parliament. Okay, so they look for which provinces, if they had more impact, and what they would do is they started just printing ads on Facebook, targeting these people, iterating the ad, changing it every time until they, they got a reaction from it. So starting saying, uh, you know, you have somebody, you see, for example, somebody in the middle of, I don't know where in, in Leon, and you start targeting them and giving them a message on careful because Podemos is going to win, or careful because the other parties are going to win. Until they got a reaction, somebody clicked on it and they said, okay, we're gonna launch this ad constantly to these people. You, it, you may say it doesn't have a lot, of, uh, a lot of impact, but seriously, it's not because of his popularity that he won. I, I can tell you that. He's got a 30% rating popularity. All the other political parties lost votes in absolute terms. The only one who won votes is this one, and they won, they won seats beyond anyone's expectations. And the only thing different they did on these elections with respect to the last elections is hiring this group, the Messina group, who prototypes the message they send to people. All right? This is another prototyping technique. The Mechanical Turk, or the Wizard of Oz, is a technique where you have somebody simulate what a machine would do before you actually build uh, the app or the, <laughs> the solution, right? Come here. <laughs> so for example, IBM in the 70s, they, they knew they wanted to launch uh, the voice recognition software. All right, the voice recognition software is something that is, I don't know if you use it today, but in the 70s, it required so much investment and so much time to develop that they thought about testing whether it would make sense or not. So what they did is they looked for people who, whose job involved a lot of writing, and they brought them into a room in front of a computer, and they sat them down. And they got them to speak out what they were saying, dictate what they wanted to say, and then on the computer screen, the letters would appear. They thought it was the machine translating it for them, but it was actually somebody else in the other room listening to what they were saying and writing it at the same time. So at that moment, they actually decided that it wasn't a worthy enough project because of the development efforts it required back then, this is in the 70s, and the, the, the value they perceived. Because uh, the, the user said, the customer said, I like it, but I'm not gonna use, I mean, they said, I like it, I'm gonna use it. They would answer, I like it, I'm gonna use it. But then after half an hour, they found out they felt weird talking to a computer. And as a matter of fact, Today we have this technology. How many of you, by a raise of hands, use this technology to write reports? Nobody, right? So imagine if they had taken all that time in the 70s to develop this with all the, the effort they required and then have nobody use it. And I believe it was created in the 90s in, as a freeware software in some university in the state, so makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. And the last, uh, I've got two more. I'm just gonna show you two more techniques and then we get to working, okay? We have one that I love because it's, it's called product hacking or you can call it relabel, rent or borrowing, et cetera. Uh, and, and this is, uh, for this one, I, I spoke to um, I, an entrepreneur from Jakarta, from Indonesia. His name is Dematio. He, he said he, he created a concept because he lived far away from his wife and he said, well, talking to my wife on Skype is great, but physical intimacy is a bit weird. So what he created is this concept. It's called VBs. It's a remote control vibrator, right? I interviewed him. He's, he's excellent. We had, it was the funnest interview I've ever done. And, and he told me at the beginning, you know, he wasn't sure whether this concept would work. He was living in Singapore at the time. And he said the first the first thing that he would do was, um, instead of building this and making the mistake and not finding a market, which is the fatal mistake, he said, before you do that, what I recommend is hack an existing product. So he got vibrators already in the market, and he connected something else, and he sold 500 units. And from that, he learned, and he created the final product, which, is today, which it is today which I actually have the app for. And 
Wait a minute. Silence. You are wearing it. You are wearing it, sir. Yeah, but it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's got one here. It was a, I just wanted to play a joke. So anyways. <laughs> it hasn't been used more than once. <laughs> All right, so he actually sent this one to me after the interview. But the idea is that we may think that customers are not going to like that the, the vibrator connected to another or whatever, but he sold 500 units. And from that experiment, he actually learned something. And, and I'm going to try to say this with a straight face and not laughing. But he learned that the device he sold was a penetration device. And this is not penetration. This is actually external. So you can wear it. You can wear it all day long. Yeah. The idea, if you watch his video, it's like... <laughs> But anyways, that was the learning he got from selling 500 units, then iterating, et cetera. That is also a way of prototyping. And finally, I'm going to show this last uh, technique. I have a friend who prototypes the gifts, the presents he gives to his girlfriend. So he, before he buys a present, he prototypes it. Can anybody think of a way of prototyping the gift to your girlfriend? And I think you guys know that. <laughs> A pay, you pay a girlfriend? <laughs> you buy a girlfriend? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> That's a good one. No. What he does is he goes up to her and he says, and, and, and this is true, I mean, he told me because he was really struggling and he didn't know what, what to buy her. He never bought her the right gift. So he went to her and he said, I bought you a present. Can you guess what it is? And she started making all this list of things she wanted and didn't want, oh, you didn't buy me a bike. I don't have space for a bike. I hope you didn't buy me a blouse. It's not even hot yet, whatever. And she started saying all these things. So he made a list and then went to buy the present before he had even bought it. So anyways, these are techniques. But essentially, um, if we want you to get something out of this, is that the techniques it's themselves are worthless. I mean, this, they're not worthless. They're just the names are there, but, but we don't need you to learn the names or anything. The most important part is the mindset. So the mindset of prototyping is, what can I learn today that I don't need to learn next week? Right? How can I learn today something quickly so that my version tomorrow is better and my version the day after tomorrow is even better? And that is what we want you to take out of this, not, not the names themselves. However, we have brought actually the first version of our booklet. This is something we've used. Actually, I'm going to tell you already, this is something we've used for, for our, companies, our companies we work for. This is the old version. And right now, we're, we're working on the new version. And actually, some of you already signed up on the website because we want to prototype our book. <laughs> we're that cool. Yes, please. Like, how example you're giving, I was just asking, it feels like I can imagine it with a product. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you're also doing services. Uh -huh. Like, having you prototype a service or like that's somebody's going to need that. Good question. So she was asking, how can you prototype a service? As a matter of fact, prototyping can be not just a service product. It can even be a strategy. We've even prototyped departments. We've worked with clients who wanted to say, if we change our department, how would it work? So we went there and had a workshop and worked it. So the way you prototype a service is essentially the same way. You can look, let me show you. I was going to show you this, the page here. Here we have a bunch of prototypes. These are all different prototypes you can use. And we're going to know how to use this tool now. But the way this works is you work from the least sophisticated to the more sophisticated. OK? So the least sophisticated is something you can launch today. And this is something you can launch tomorrow. And this is something you can launch. The first one, so for example, the, the false door or the smoke test, this is something where you can just launch a few ads on Facebook. And you can sell your product or you can sell your service. For example, if you're offering uh, an experience to go visit, um, I don't know, the countryside or a wine cellar, which two gentlemen here will do later, the way you can prototype that is actually just writing it down and saying, hey, you want to buy a visit to the wine cellar? And that itself is a service. But you can do that with, with essentially anything. You can find out insights about your solution before creating it, for sure, in any way. And we'll see. But thank you. Thank you for it was a good one. So, anyways, this is our this is our the first version of our book. One thing I forgot to mention. As a rule of thumb, we consider a prototype validated if people give you your customers give you money, time, 
the reputation. So for example, if they share your idea, if they share your ad on Facebook, that is their reputation. They're putting their reputation on the line for you, so it means it matters. And then the, the contact details. So for example, my email address, my phone number, et cetera. If somebody gives you their email address, so for example, and you're gonna feel prototype, but when we ask for your emails on the book, if you give us your email, it means that you're somewhat interested in it, right? Whereas if you don't give us your email, or in this meetup nobody comes, we know you're not interested in it, right? So your time for us means a lot. It means we're doing the right thing. If we organize another meetup and nobody comes, we know we're not doing the right thing. You better come. <laughs> don't make us feel bad. All right, so the way we're gonna do this now is I have some tools. We're gonna have some, ah, sorry. I don't have enough space here. So we, we have some tools here and we're gonna have four people come up and pitch. Maybe we can have five, I think. We, we might have five. And we're gonna divide you in five groups because I think we're so many, it doesn't make sense to maybe work in, in one single project. I think we can work in five different projects. So these five different people are gonna help us, uh, are gonna give us their idea, their pitch. And what we will do is we will identify the hypotheses behind their idea, okay? So every new product, innovative solution lies on assumptions, things that you don't know. You don't know or you don't know, or things you don't know at all, right? And you want to test. So we will identify what the hypotheses are and then we will use a tool to create prototypes. So today from here, the five people who will be pitching will get prototypes from, for their idea and they can launch tonight and start learning tonight. Oh yeah. Unless you go watch Barca, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can start selling. <laughs> By the way, thank you for coming here instead of going to watch uh, Barca because uh, <laughs> my partner's actually, he wants to leave beforehand. He wants to go watch a game. <laughs> the bastard. Okay, so anyways, we have three, two tools to do this. The number one assumption we make when creating our idea is who will be using our idea, right? So the customer you have in mind might not even make sense. For example, I was once working on a project where we would have an Internet of Things device. Everybody know what an Internet of Things device is? It was a, a device connected to water consumption. And it was for, uh, um, what do you call them, green-minded people, so the tree-hugging people that wanted to save trees and water. It turns out that these people turn their Wi-Fi off at night, their router, so the device would not work for them, right? So we had an assumption on our customer that proved to be wrong. We thought that they would love technical solutions. They don't, they turn off routers at night, most of them anyways. So this is the first tool we will use. Uh, we will define the demographic, so who they are, even give a name, what their profile is, their values and fears, and also goals and challenges. We will use an example right now so you can see how this works. Then we use this very simple tool. It's, this is known as a customer journey. You might have seen customer journeys before. We use a very simple one which consists of five stages. So every product or service or solution has to be discovered. Then the customer evaluates whether they want it or not. Then they interact with it. We create a retention. We have them coming back and buying our solution again. And last, they start referentiating to their friends, okay? And you will see this in the example. And when we identify all those hypotheses, and please note the shape of this, we come here and we start finding prototypes. So for example, if we detect that your hypothesis is here, you can start using all these prototypes here. And we will, we will do a very simple uh, dynamic where we will have people coming up with uh, prototypes like this, like that, like that, et cetera, okay? And this is from least sophisticated to more complex. This is the MVP, everybody knows the MVP, the minimum viable product. So it's what looks more like the solution, all right? And as I said before, again, we are and I, and I will use this to promote it. We are actually working on our, on our book, what will be our, our next, our first real book, which will be like this, but a bit more detailed. And 
and you can sign up on the website here, handbookweprotoplay.com, because we want you to become our beta editor. So we want you to help us prototype the book. So we will give you the first few chapters, and you tell us if you like it or not. If you like it, we send you the next chapter, and then the other chapter, et cetera. And from your feedback, we will make a better book, hopefully. But I think so. All right? We already have some people signing up, so if, if you want to sign up and become our beta editors, just go to this website and give us your email, please. Thank you. All right. So now, having said that, that is enough of the, of the theory part of the class. I will have these two wonderful gentlemen join me on stage. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Can you very, very briefly explain what your idea is? Okay, yeah, our idea is pretty simple. We are just three wine lovers, uh, wine maker, uh, sommelier, and uh, sales wine agents. And what we want to be is to, to enjoy to, with, with the tourists our, our experience. Or we always love to, to talk about wine. So we are in Garraf. In Garraf there are many wineries and many wine dressing wines and people don't know these wineries. So we want to, to, to attract the tourist people and to enjoy with us and to talk about wine and to be in touch with the ground because the typical tourist uh, visit is to go to, to, to typical wineries. But what we want is to, to have nice experience, to have fun with them because for us the important thing is not if the wine was okay, if the, if, if the winery was beautiful or not, is to have fun with, with us. With wine it's hard not of to. Of course, it's much easier. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> what else? So how, do, how does, for example, how does it work? You know what, if you want, let's, let's just go directly to the, to the customer journey. To the customer journey, you explain to me here. So how, how does it work when somebody, how do they discover you exist? Well, uh, go ahead. Now, well, now we, we, have, we have like uh, little uh, papers with, well, an answer you like, like Some flyers. flyers. Where, okay, where, flyers. where there's our information, some pictures, and some some things we can we can do. There's information about the the wineries that we are going to visit, the services we are we are. I'm going to use this as a blackboard because they <laughs> didn't bring a blackboard. The services we are offering and uh, and and the options that, that you can that you can choose to to do. It's. We want to be like the the Garraf wine ambassadors, and then. We are now starting with the social media and okay. flyers. Uh, okay, so on social media, people. What, what social media are you on? We are on Instagram, uh, we are on Twitter, and no, Facebook. Instagram. Not, okay. not yet, but we're starting. Instagram, so, Twitter, and Facebook. And TripAdvisor? TripAdvisor. Okay. Yeah. What? Oh, yeah. We're starting for real. <laughs> are you? Yeah, what are you doing there? You should be pitching. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's one. It's like uh, the wineries. It's a, it's a kind of trip for real, but just in the okay. wine business. So somebody discovers you exist, and then they look at the flyer and they say, "Nice." How do they make their decision? How do they know? How do they decide that they want to be use your service? It's a service. I think that the. We offer the experience to be in touch with the locals, so uh -huh. it's just not a, just a, a winery visit, it's to be in touch with us. So you offer, you offer a connect, uh, uh, like, so the words you use, for example, are authentic, right? Of course. Okay. <laughs> no? And, and I, you said there are some options, or how many options do you have, do you offer? The thing is, we are trying to do something different, something not really touristic, something not, uh, Okay. Something to live. Some, okay. Something and, and to experience. How does that? How does it say that on the flyer? How does it say it's going to be different? It's, well, it's, a, it's a good question. <laughs> no, 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 it's 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 asking asking people if they want to do something new. So if they they want to to experience what what people in the wine world do. Okay. So the flyer day, so. the flyer asks you what you want to do. Mm -hmm. It says, we are a winery. How do you want to experience the wine? 
Uh, actually, in the flyer, we're talking about a specific activity okay. offering to winery visits and uh, uh, barbecue show cooking. Okay. And then that's the okay. starting point. And then because we're in Garraf, visit. So we we have we can rent. For example, we can rent boats and do wine tastings in the sea. Uh -huh. Oh, we also have mountains. We can rent more uh, motorbikes, segways, whatever to to okay. do. A, so the idea, a little bit, is to make a platform to to make a tailor-made uh, visit. So okay. depending of what you like to do, not only in the wine area, but also maybe if you like the sea, we can do a wine tasting on the boat. Or if you like mountains, we can do a all right and, and or, so this would be on a website. So this. I would normally draw on this, but if I draw, they might kick me out. But this carries your customers to a website. And in the website, you offer them different options, which are authentic and different, and might include Segway motorbikes and a visit to the cellar plus a barbecue, right? OK, yes. once they decide they want, they like your idea, yes, I like it. I want to go to Garraf to enjoy that wine. How do they interact? What do they do? Okay, they, they can interact by, by email or by comment, like commenting, commenting the social media uh -huh. or, or phone. There's, On there's social a, media. Okay, so they contact you and they have to organize a, a, a meeting or you have different time slots? Well, we are quite uh, open about uh, Okay, so they call tables. you and say, so I, need, we are, we are, we are. I need a visit at 6 a.m. tomorrow. You, you offer that. Okay, how many people? <laughs> we, are there. we are there. Okay, so it's tailor-made. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that, okay. that's the thing. If, if, you, yeah, pick me up if, if you need a, a pick-up somewhere, we can go and, and, and pick you up. Does everybody want to go now? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's go later. Okay, and once they tried it, how do you get them coming back again? If you get them coming back again at all, the thing is like it's it's that if you as it's a thing that you can uh, design mm -hmm. more or less as, as you want, so you can have different experience the next time, or you can come with other people and and and, and make them experience what you what you what you did before. Okay, so so coming with other people, right? Yeah, and we have. So you were saying maybe there are like 10, 12 wineries. So if you enjoy the experience with us, let's try another winery or another kind of experience. So mm -hmm. there are many things we okay, can Okay, and you offer different wines. Okay, so different. All right, so this, and who do you have in mind? Who's there, your customer? There, there's also, okay. there's also the, the thing that we, we sell wine as well. So, okay. so if, if you like the wine, you can come back and, and, okay. and buy some more wine. And your wine just hooks people. Right? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, and who's your, who's your customer, the one customer you have in mind? What's, her, what's his, her name? Manolo? No. Manolo? Normally, no, normally we're thinking more of uh, foreigner people coming okay. from, yeah. Foreign people, all right. Yeah, normally, so I would normally go to the step before, which is the customer, we'd have foreign people. All right, so the way this works, and you will see, because I see some confused faces, the way this works is now we have, I mean, it's very simple, we went very quickly, but we have an idea on how this would work, right? And all of a sudden, I'm already seeing hypotheses. I don't know if everybody is. Assumptions they're making. They're making the assumption, which is, is not wrong, it's we are nobody to judge their idea, neither are you or them. It's not to say they're wrong or not. We just say, hey, there's an assumption there, you might have to look into it. So the, the first assumption for me would be that, that foreigners, before they go to prepare their visit, they'll go on social media and start preparing. I like the TripAdvisor thing, the, the, or, or the TripAdvisor trip for real. But for example, for me, that they'll look into Facebook before deciding where to go is, is an assumption. I'm not saying it's wrong, it's an assumption. And that's where you need to test. See, we break down all the, the, the whole experiment into assumptions, and then we test them individually. Then. The way they, they hire, which is they, they'll, they'll do it just on the spot. For me, it's an assumption because I wonder if people that go visit some, some place don't want it all just closed, right? Be so between two options, what is a foreigner like? Do they like to have one simple closed option or a very open and flexible option? Maybe they do. And there's pre people that want and people that don't, right? But for your customer, what, what do they prefer? 
that for me. So I would write, we would write all these hypotheses and actually mark them in red and start analyzing all the different hypotheses. Everybody see how that, that works? Okay, and then once we have these hypotheses, and again from the, also from this guy over here, the, the person we've drawn over here, we would go into this map, all right? So we find, for example, we had one hypothesis here, which is that travel for travelers, travelers want go on social media or decide their trip on social media. Why is it important to, to see it or not, if, it, if it's true or not? Because they're devoting a lot of time on social media, right? You're on Instagram, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, that's a lot of effort and time and maybe it's not serving your purpose, right? So I'm not saying it, is, I'm not saying it isn't. He's like, oh man, I, all this time. So the, the travelers here, so you might want to test out here and maybe, right now I'm thinking of the Facebook ad, but you can, you can do it on, on Google, et cetera, or flyers, or flyers, but you, can t you should go target people that don't live in, in Garraf, in Barcelona, or in Spain, you just target people that live outside and offer different options and see if they interact with it. One option could be enjoy your trip, your next trip to Barcelona, and the other option you can say uh, uh, go visit the beaches somewhere else. Something that has nothing to do with the trip. And if you get more people interacting with this one, enjoy it. So you should have like a control group, something that says, okay, they normally, people in this country normally click this amount of times a day. But on my idea, they click twice as much, right? Then you've sort of proven, again, this is just one proof, one little proof, which gets you on your next stage, which is I'm going to go to the airport of uh, El Prat, and I'm going to ask people if, uh, how they found out, or, or even just asking your customers, how did you find out where we exist, et cetera, right? I'm just launching here some ideas, but there's many different experiments you can do. And I'm launching the very simple ones, but they can get more complex, as we saw with our guy that makes vibrators. All right? So anyways, this is one pitch. We will have one group working with them, and I would like to invite to the stage the second pitcher, and second pitcher, are we actually? Yeah, yes. And wait, we're missing somebody, I think. I have a team, okay. believe it or not. Oh my god, there's a team, yay! Bye, bye. I'm just gonna make something up. Like everything's a pitch. An idea, but okay. So um, technology has changed uh, how consumers um, behave, and um, regular channels are not working anymore for brands to get to these consumers because consumers don't have now the power to really choose what they want to buy and how they want to relate to the to the, what they're buying. So um, our hypothesis is that um, really what people want now is to experience, to experience the brand, to be, like feel part of it to actually later have a relationship with this brand, buy the brand, and have like a, I don't know some relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're creating is a new way for brands to get closer to their customers through uh, technology, which is through creative experiences and brand ex experiences. So let's say um, uh, Bershka or Thada or any of these stores, if they have like some kind of installation in their store where the people, when the consumers come in, they can interact, they can, I don't know, like some kind of creative photo call or whatever, where like you take a picture, it automatically goes on Instagram, you're creating a lot of branded content without even having any effort to do, and the people is relating to that brand and having fun with that brand. You can do it in a store, you can do it in a restaurant, you can do it in a festival. A bunch of, fest, uh, of brands are spending a bunch of money on festival like Sonas, Primavera Sound, and then you go there and all they have is like this logo on a cardboard where nobody takes pictures, nobody's doing any content, nobody's creating anything for you. So what we're doing is let's make some installation in the middle of the festival where people are going to come in, they're going to have fun, they're going to leave with something they can put on Facebook, they can put on Instagram, and they create your own content and you're not doing anything. And all that money that you're actually putting into the sponsorship, you're getting in return somehow. So basically okay. this is what we're doing. All right. And sorry, one question, who's, who's your target customer then in this We're case? We're B2B, so any like big brands. So the person in the marketing, marketing department, marketing et, cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so, so when, we, the, when we draw the customer for them, 
it's somebody in the marketing department and they have a name, a last name, and they have their fears, values, and challenges. So we have to convince that person that what they need is their solution. Okay? This is just, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Let's clap for them.